So I recently heard a story about a man named Alan Calhoun, who lives in Bristol, Connecticut. Now, Alan and his wife were having a garage sale at their home, and they were just getting rid of stuff that they never really used. One of those items was a mirror that had this gaudy, aqua-colored frame that just never went with anything else in their house, and they just didn't like it and didn't have a place for it, so they just put it out there to sell. Another man who was trying to decorate his apartment for cheap came by on the garage sale and found the mirror and excitedly paid one dollar for it. All right, as the exchange was happening, he said, this is a great deal. Look, it even has the plastic covering on it still. And the man, Alan Calhoun, watched uh, with a pit in his stomach as the man peeled back the aqua covering to reveal this beautiful gold-covered mirror. I mean, isn't that the ultimate dream? I know a lot of people, I know Dennis loves going to garage sales and swap meets. Isn't that the ultimate find when you're, you know, you look at something that that guy doesn't even understand the value of and you get it for cheap. You get it for great price. That's the ultimate dream, right? We even have a, a saying for that. One man's trash is another man's treasure. It's amazing that these two men could look at the same mirror and come to two different conclusions about that mirror and about its value. Whereas one saw something of value and desirable, the other was like, yeah, I don't even really want it, I'll sell it for a dollar. You know, a lot of people approach Christ in that same way. There are people who look at themselves in the mirror of Jesus, and some see there the Son of God. Some see the Savior and Lord in the flesh, and they put their faith in him, and they follow Jesus. And then others look at themselves in that mirror, read God's word and shrug their shoulders and go, "Ah, I don't get it. They just turn and walk away. Right now we're in the middle of a series called Game Changer. And we're looking at some of the powerful ways that Jesus has changed the way we play the game of life. And one of the ways he did that was by telling stories, powerful stories that reshape who we are, cause us to rethink what we do and redefine how we live. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 7, where Jesus is going to tell another story, a story he told over 2,000 years ago, but this story might as well have been told last week. It's still incredibly pertinent to us and to our lives. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to read along or pull it up on your smartphone or tablet. It'll be in Luke chapter 7, starting verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. All right, we'll stop there. You see, Jesus frustrated the dog out of the Pharisees. He was constantly challenging them, publicly dishonoring them and shaming them, just threatening their way of life, uh, discouraging people from following them, disparaging their worldview, putting down the way that they'd been leading the people of Israel. But here's a Pharisee who invites Jesus to his house, and Jesus goes. You see, it's amazing that Jesus treats people who believed differently than he did, people who behaved differently than he did, his opponents even, with tremendous grace, tremendous respect, tremendous love even. And so he goes to this guy's house to recline at the table. Now that little key word recline tells you that this isn't just any meal. This is a special meal. They didn't recline at the table for just any meal, but this was a special one. Most likely, this is probably the weekly Sabbath banquet that they would have. You see, as their Sabbath began, they would go and gather in the synagogue and a teacher would speak. It probably was Jesus who taught in the synagogue. And then after that, you'd go to somebody's house. Well, this Pharisee, whose name is going to be revealed in shortly as Simon, Simon wants to do the honorable thing in front of the synagogue and invites Jesus back to his house for a party. Jesus, of course, as we know, loves parties, so he goes. But this special reclining thing, it was like a party that's open to everybody. You see, we'd think that this might be an exclusive event, but it wasn't. They left the door wide open and anyone could actually come in and listen to the further discussion about the passage or questions on theology or maybe the teacher was going to say something else. And so the men would recline around the table 
because women and slaves weren't allowed to. They had to stand along the wall on the outside. That is important because of what happens in verse 37. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So a woman walks in who's lived a sinful life, a sinner. That's most likely a euphemism for a prostitute in that town. So a sinner walks in, and because Jesus is reclining at the table, they're basically these little things that were a couple feet off the ground, and you kind of lean or lay on your stomach or on your side eating, and your feet would be towards the wall. Well, she's not allowed to go to the table, so she stands back here behind Jesus and begins weeping. Tears get on Jesus' feet. She puts down her hair and starts cleaning them up and then anoints him with oily perfume. Now, while she means this as an act of honor, because of the type of woman she is, this comes across as dishonor. You see, it was very offensive for a woman to put down her hair in public. In our day and age, that's maybe akin to a woman just taking off her shirt in public and running around. It was something that you didn't do. Some rabbis even taught that if a woman let her hair down in public, that's sufficient grounds for divorce. So she's letting her hair down in public. Okay, I mean, wiping someone's feet, that's something you did back then, but you didn't kiss people's feet. That's weird. So this woman is doing some crazy stuff. And who she is and what she's doing is offensive to a guy like Simon, the Pharisee. Look at his response in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Simon was part of Israel's religious right. He was religious, and he was right. And people who disagreed with him, people who lived sinful, immoral lives, well, those people were clearly far from God, and they needed to be shunned. Because after all, God's a holy God, he's a perfect God, and he can't tolerate sin, ergo, he cannot tolerate sin nurse. And any prophet who comes from God would surely recognize a sinner if they saw one, would surely treat a sinner with disdain. See, because that's what Simon thought God wanted. That is what Simon thought a prophet of God's should do. So he draws the false conclusion that, well, Jesus must not be from God. Jesus shouldn't treat sinners this way. The way he's receiving this woman, the way he's allowing her to serve him, that, no way. This man is not a man of God. This is not how sinners should be treated. No, 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 we label them and we shun them. We don't let them do this. So Jesus responds to him with his now infamous preface. I'd like to tell you a story. Let's read in verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. You see, Jesus perceives his unasked question and responds to it. Tell me, teacher, he says. Verse 41, two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answers, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. So Jesus tells a story, a game-changing story, where he says, you see, somebody who's been forgiven a lot shows a lot of gratitude. They show a lot of love. Someone who's been forgiven very little shows a little love, a little honor, a little gratitude. 
And then Jesus asks an important but easy to overlook question at the beginning of verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman, but said to Simon, do you see this woman? Of course Simon saw her. Everyone saw her. Everyone heard her crying. Everyone watched her put down her hair. Everyone could smell the perfume. Of course Simon saw her. But what is it Jesus wanted Simon to see? Let's read on in verse 44. I came into your house and you did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Now it would be easy to conclude, and maybe natural to conclude, from Jesus' explanation of why he told the parable, that he'd be saying, Simon, you're just a terrible host. All right, really? I mean, she is the party crasher is doing what you should have done as the host. But that, that would be a misunderstanding of the first century cultural norms. You see, washing someone's feet was indeed something people would do, but it, that wasn't normal. That wasn't like an everyday activity. You would wash a guest's feet only if they traveled a great distance. And walking from the synagogue three houses down to eat some food would not really qualify. And even so, there's, there'd be zero cultural expectation for Simon to do it himself. I mean, this was a dirty job. Washing people's feet, that was for the lowest slave or servant to do. So secondly, Jesus says, he says, you didn't wash my feet. He says, you didn't give me a kiss. Now that was a customary greeting, but that was a customary greeting between like tight friends. That wasn't like you just didn't give random people kisses. You didn't, hey, teacher, let me put a, sl put a big sloppy wet one on you. That wasn't the cultural norm. That, that's something you did with tight friends, but not social acquaintances. There'd be zero cultural expectation that Simon would have actually, or was supposed to kiss Jesus. No, that, that just wasn't something that he really should have done. And lastly, he didn't pour oil on Jesus' head, is what he says. He didn't put oil on my head. Again, that's something you did for a guest with very special honor. That wasn't something you were expected to just do for anyone or for any guest. But what we see here is Jesus drawing a sharp contrast. The woman did these things, and Simon did not do these things. But you got to understand, Simon didn't really do anything wrong. Simon didn't do anything wrong, but Simon also didn't do anything right either. You see, Jesus is pointing out the contrast between the two. He says this woman didn't care about her honor. You know what, Simon? You only care about your honor. You invited me here to protect your honor, to influence your honor. Everything you didn't do for me is because it would be dishonorable for you to wash my feet. No, you care about your honor. Simon protected his honor and did not give Jesus great honor. The woman dishonored herself in order to honor Jesus. Do you see the difference? He protected his honor, didn't honor Jesus. She sacrificed her public honor, allowed herself to be ridiculed, allowed people to whisper and be shocked in awe, all so that she could show Christ great honor. And Simon, Jesus basically says to Simon, Simon, you're so blind. You are so focused on this woman's sin that you don't even see your own. You are the one who are labeling her this sort of woman, but what sort of man are you? You are blinded by what she's done. I'm blinded by what you haven't done. You're offended by this woman's sin, by this woman's unrighteousness, I'm offended by what you have done or have not done, what you have failed to do for me. And I, I imagine Simon would just been slack-jawed, like, what, I, 
I didn't do anything wrong. How, Jesus, how are you making her the sinner, the hero, and me, the non-sinner righteous person, the villain? I didn't even do anything. That's exactly Jesus' point. He didn't do anything. Jesus makes that clear in verse 47 to 50. He says to the woman, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. But as her great love has shown, as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, this woman was grateful. This woman had been saved. This woman had been forgiven. And she showed her great love for Jesus. She was willing to sacrifice her honor in order to honor him out of gratitude. And so she loved him out of gratitude. And as one scholar aptly summarized, as I, Howard Marshall, do you have it up there? Love is the way in which gratitude is expressed. This woman loved Jesus, and so she was willing to let her honor go. And Jesus welcomed and embraced her. He could handle her sin. But let's go back to Jesus' question to unpack this and understand it a little bit more. When Jesus says, Simon, do you see this woman? What did Simon see when he looked at this woman? Simon saw a sinner. He saw a label. He saw a lifestyle. He saw a reputation. Simon saw a person who believed differently than he did. Simon saw a person who behaved differently than he did. Simon saw someone who wasn't even worth giving a name, even though everyone in town knew her name. You see, Simon just saw a label. He didn't see a person, he saw a label. But Jesus saw beyond the label, he saw a life. He saw a person. He saw a woman loved by God, valued by God, created in the image of God, and worthy of just as much love, affection, and attention as any righteous person. Simon didn't realize this, but he actually had the bigger spiritual problem. That's the story Jesus tells. Hey, this woman, she has been forgiven much. Look how much she loves. Simon was probably maybe tempted to see himself even in that other person. Well, okay, maybe I'm just someone who's been forgiven little. No, he's not. He hasn't been forgiven at all. Jesus told this story in response to Simon's attitude. The woman had been forgiven of her unrighteousness, but Simon was stuck in his self-righteousness. You see, Simon had the bigger spiritual problem. Even though he was the non-sinner, even though he was the righteous one, even though he hadn't done anything nearly as terrible as this woman had, Jesus says, you have the bigger problem. That's his game changer. Jesus' game changer from this story saying that while the religious are really offended by the unrighteous, Jesus is more offended by the self-righteous. Why? Why is Jesus more offended by self-righteousness than unrighteousness? Because of this. There's nothing he can do for the self-righteous. Self-righteousness will always end in hell. There's no other alternative. But the unrighteous, if someone's unrighteous, there's hope. Because an unrighteous person knows they're not perfect. An unrighteous person knows they can't do it on their own. An unrighteous person knows that they are unrighteous. They're looking for a savior. They're looking for rescue. And there's hope. There's hope that an unrighteous person will hear the gospel 
that they will hear the message that Jesus loved them and died for them and for their sin on the cross. And by putting their faith alone in him, they can have eternal, everlasting life with God. There's hope for the unrighteous. Jesus can deal with the unrighteous. He made a way on the cross. He has an answer for the unrighteous. Being unrighteous does not keep people out of heaven. Being self-righteous will always keep a person out of heaven. Because self-righteousness says, I'm really not that bad. I mean, at least I'm not like that woman. You know, it, yeah, I've done some small things, but it's not a big deal. My sin's not nearly as bad as someone else's. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty good. God's pretty happy that uh, I'm on his team. And self-righteousness shuts the door on Jesus. I don't need you. I can do this. I can be my own Lord and Savior. I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. I'm moral enough. I give enough. I serve enough. I care enough. I love enough. Enough to overcome whatever my spiritual problem is. Jesus is far more offended by self-righteousness than he is by unrighteousness because self-righteousness closes the door on grace for themselves and for others. Now, even as Christians, we have to admit that sometimes self-righteous attitudes can come out from us, which is really paradoxical because to be a Christian, to be a believer, is to admit that we are unrighteous to put our faith in Christ and to be clothed in his righteousness. Yet, we often fall back into patterns of the old man, the old woman, the old person we were before Christ who counted on self-righteousness. So how do we know if we're doing that? How do we know if we're acting in some self-righteous ways? Well, you might be self-righteous if you think you're better than others because of something you've done or because of something you've never done. You might be self-righteous if the faults of others dominate your conversation. You might be self-righteous if you've ever said, oh, that guy really needs Jesus. Or you might be self-righteous if you're hearing me talk about the term self-righteous and you're thinking of someone else. I think as Christians, if we're honest, if we look at Simon, we see a little bit of a mirror here. And I think self-righteousness sometimes comes out of us when it comes to the way we deal with people who believe and behave differently than we do. We tend to think, or we can think, that we're better than them, than those sinners, than those who are unrighteous. Let me drive this game changer home a little bit. I'll drive it into my own personal life, and I think it might be something you might be able to glean from as well. Maybe on that particular issue, but maybe on a wider issue. About three weeks ago, uh, in a sermon, I brought to you some of the results from a major study that the Barna Group did among millennials. Now, millennials are roughly considered those born between 1982 and 2004. So our 12 to 34-year-olds are the millennials. And the Barner Group did a major study among them to see what are their top attitudes associated with Christians and with Christianity. Number one at the top of their list, the number one thing millennials associate with us and with our faith is that we are anti-homosexuality. That's the number one thing that comes to people's minds about us. Now let's be honest, this is a tough issue to address, isn't it? It's a tough issue for us to navigate well. And so as I'm looking at my own life, I see it's easy for self-righteousness to come out in the way that I talk about this and maybe for you too in the way we talk about this. So in my journey with God as I walk with him, I, God's challenging me to be more like Christ in how we deal with people who live and think differently than we do. So I'm learning to ask myself three questions about this issue. 
Maybe there are three questions that you could ask yourself or we as a church might want to think about as well. First question is this. Am I picking and choosing the scriptures on which I stand? This is our number one witness. So this is something we need to get right with how we deal with this in our world and in our day. Am I picking and choosing the scriptures on which I stand? I think the Bible has some pretty clear things to say about homosexuality. It's not God's design. But the Bible also has some very clear things to say about loving your neighbor. Every neighbor. All your neighbors. That includes our LGBTQ neighbors. And it talks about how we should love them and give them grace. Now, I feel like most Christians right now tend to fall on one side or the other. They're either all about truth and giving that message, but they lack and have forgotten grace. Or in an effort to love them and be gracious, they've abandoned what scripture teaches. What's the truth? People tend to fall on one side or the other, but my question is, whoever said we had to pick? The Apostle John, who was one of Jesus' closest followers in his gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 14, says this, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, who never sinned, and he never said sin was okay, approached everyone full of grace and full of truth. I think we need to be full of both as well. When we approach this topic, are we coming from one angle or the other? Or are we encompassing both? Are we talking with people about this in a way that communicates both love and truth? When we're talking about it, are we sensitive? Are we kind? Are we loving? Are we gentle? Are we gracious? Or are we harsh? Are we dismissive? Are we judgmental? Are we a little self-righteous? We don't have to pick. It's messy. It's not always going to be pretty. It's not always going to be easy. But I think there has to be a way to be full of grace and truth because that's what Jesus was. And if you're a believer, then you are in him and he is in you. You have all you need for life and godliness by the Spirit in you. You are full of grace and truth by the Spirit. So how do we walk in that when it comes to this issue? Second question. Am I singling out homosexuality in a unique category from all other sins? You see, it was important for Simon to label this woman this sort of woman. And we often use the same kind of labels. We go, hey, I'd like you to meet my friend John. John's gay, just so you know. Like that's the most important thing that someone needs to know about John. We don't do that with other sins. Hey, this is my friend Sally. She gossips a lot. (laughs) Be careful what you say around her. Oh, this this is my buddy Pat. Pat's got a real anger problem. Why do we do that with this one sin? Are we singling it out? Why is it if a Hindu family were to move in next door, we would go out of our way to welcome them, to get to know them, to ask them about their background, about their story, about their beliefs, try to figure out why they believe the way they do and look for a connecting point to love them and share the gospel with them. But if a gay couple moves in next door, we freak out. We go, oh no, now like uh, we're there next door. I'm unclean, everything's dirt. Why? Why do we act that way? Why do we think that? Are we singling out homosexuality as a sin that is somehow unique from everything else? But Scott, the Bible says it's a sin. Look in 1 Corinthians 6. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. I assume you're referring to verses 9 and 10 in your high-pitched voice. (laughs) Where the Apostle Paul writes this to the Corinthian church, or do you not know 
that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, there it is, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Let's set aside briefly for the fact there might be a difference of nuance between entering the kingdom of God and inheriting the kingdom of God, maybe. We'll set that aside. The text says those who practice homosexuality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There it is, black and white, the end, right? Nothing to argue. Is there anything else on this list? Like, why do we only see one thing on this list? Is there anything else on this list that might prevent us from inheriting the kingdom of God? The sexually immoral. Anyone ever looked at porn? In the last couple weeks? Idolaters. Has anyone here ever loved anything or anyone more than Jesus? You can't inherit the kingdom of God. Adulterers. You see, heterosexual sex outside of marriage is on the exact same list as homosexual sex. And heterosexual affairs outside of marriage, Jesus says, aren't all that much matters of the body, but matters of the heart. Anyone who looks at another person lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. Anybody here ever done that? All of us. All of us have. Thieves don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. Has anyone here ever burned a CD or a movie? Of course not. Of course not. Anyone here ever been greedy? Maybe wanted more than you should have? Has anyone here ever been drunk? All right, those rainbow warrior tailgate parties are in full effect right now. There seem to be a lot of things on this list that prevent a person from inheriting the kingdom of God. And if you look at the wider context of what Paul is talking about, he is saying all of us are toast. Everyone is unrighteous. And if, it, if there's no way to deal with our unrighteousness, then we are condemned. We are far from God. But praise God that Paul doesn't stop at verse 10. There's verse 11. And it says... And thus some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen? Amen. All of us are unrighteous. And apart from Christ, there is no way to be made righteous. So why, when we look at lists of sins, do we pick that one out? Why is it when people come to church, they want to know what our stance is on homosexuality, but they don't ask us our stance on greed or pride or anything else? Are we singling it out? Why do we do this? I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I think it's because in our self-righteousness, we obsess over sins that we don't struggle with. Simon didn't struggle with being that sort of woman, so it's easy to condemn and judge and act self-righteously towards her. But I'm on this list. I'm selfish. I get angry. I'm 30 pounds overweight. Oh, but good thing gluttony's not on God's list, right? Whew, dodged one there. Wait, what? Put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. Proverbs 23, 2. Oh, but of course the sins that I struggle with aren't as bad, right? I mean, gluttony is not as bad as those other sins. And you might even be tempted to think the thought, well, I am gluttonous, but at least I'm not a homosexual. And just like that, we sound and think like Simon the Pharisee. It's so easy to do. 
Now, I'm not saying, and Scripture does not say, that all sins are equal. All right, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Jesus is saying with his Sermon on the Mount. All sins are not equal. Some have far worse consequences than others. But all sins are wrong. All sins are bad. All sins keep us equally separated from God. So in that sense, yes, all sins are problematic. There's no such thing as owing God 50 denarii while the other one owes God 500 denarii. We all owe God 500 denarii. And somebody who doesn't respond with gratitude and love towards God is somebody who doesn't understand that they owe God 500 denarii and probably beyond. Are we singling out homosexuality as a special, unique category of sin when we're communicating about this issue to people? Lastly, am I being clear about the gospel? This is probably the most important question. Am I being clear about the gospel? You see, when we ask the question, is homosexuality a sin? Do we mean by that that homosexuals can't go to heaven? Like, is that what we're saying? It's easy for that message to at least come across, but that message is dead wrong. Let me say it right now. Homosexuals don't go to hell and heterosexuals don't go to heaven. What keeps you from getting into heaven is never unrighteousness. What keeps you from going to heaven is self-righteousness, rejecting Jesus. A heterosexual, homosexual, come into heaven and into a right relationship with God in the exact same way. Putting our faith alone in Christ alone. And yes, that means repenting and turning from our sin, but we also know that never means that all sin is suddenly left behind. It's a journey. It's a time of, of growth. Sanctification, being washed, as Paul says, that is a process by which we become more like Christ. It does not mean your sexuality does not determine heaven or hell. Your relationship with Jesus Christ determines what we choose. That is the difference maker. And are we being clear on that? Or are we turning it into a bit of a competition of, well, you know, at least I don't do that. Do we think that that hell is like a lion where it's you and everybody else and you don't have to outrun the lion, you just have to outrun the slowest guy, right? Is that how we approach God? Well, all right, as long as I don't sin the worst, I should be good. Like there's a a quota for heaven that God's trying to meet and he's going to grade on a curve so you might get bumped up, right? We turned it into a competition. Well, at least I don't do those things. At least I'm not that sort of a person. At least I'm not that sort of a woman. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, it is not wise to compare ourselves with our fellow men. It's comparing one incorrect standard with another and is very apt to mislead. It is easy when we are focusing on the sins of others to overlook our own, to downplay our own, to minimize our own. Is homosexuality a sin? I think this book says so. I think yes. But so is not loving your neighbor. So is labeling people based on their sins. I've heard it before, that's something the devil does. The devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. Whereas Jesus knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. Are we calling people by their sins or are we calling them by their names? It is a sin to single out one sin because we don't struggle with it. And it's wrong to think that homosexuality in and of itself sends you to hell. It does not rejecting Jesus Christ, refusing to repent and receive him, does. But those are two different issues. Christ is the only door. And it's not unrighteousness that closes the door on Jesus. It's self-righteousness. Now we have to understand that the world has changed. It used to be in this country, those older of you, maybe you can remember this day, when 
culture basically kind of backed up our play, right? I mean, you know, scripture would say one thing and we could generally count on culture to say the same thing. Friends, those days are gone. That ship has sailed. We are now living in a time that Peter describes in 1 Peter 4.4, 4, where he says, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living and they heap abuse on you. We need to learn to interact and engage with grace and truth in this world, in this type of environment. And simply throwing truth out there apart from grace is insufficient. That's not what Jesus did either. We need to learn to seek not only correction, but connection with people. It's not about condemnation. We need to find ways for conversation. The world isn't going to agree with us. The world didn't agree with Jesus. So yes, there may be times where you will be misunderstood. There will be times when people will heap abuse on you. But like Jesus said, as his followers, we are called to bless those who curse us. We must love those who misunderstand. We must care about those who disagree. And like Jesus, treat people with love and respect, even if we disagree with each other about the right way to live, the right way to think, or the right way to believe. I have a pastor, a friend of mine, who is a pastor in Tyler, Texas. When uh, Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans in 2005, And on Friday afternoon, uh, my friend got a call from the mayor of Tyler, his town, and said, we have busloads of refugees heading this way. Would you and your church be willing to set up a shelter to take these people in on Sunday night? Now, Hurricane Katrina, you probably remember, is a horrific time. Major destruction, many people died, uh, houses and properties are destroyed. And my friend said, absolutely, of course, bring them in. And that Sunday night, 150 refugees showed up at their church and some buses. And for two weeks, that church loved them. They gave them meals. They took care of laundry. They listened to stories. They hugged with them. They cried with them. They did whatever they could to help. They made phone calls. They bought bus tickets. They sought for family. They fought with government agencies to try and get people the right help. My friend said it's the most proud he's ever been of a church that time he was there for those couple weeks. Now, just down the street from them was another church, one with, you know, those signs out front with, like, the different slogans on the front, you know, like, seven days without prayer makes one week, things like that. Well, on that sign, on that very same Sunday, they wrote, New Orleans is a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. And that bus filled with those refugees, past that church in order to get to the shelter at the other church. Which of those churches acted with grace and truth? Which of those two churches lived the way that Jesus would have wanted them to live? What would he have done in their shoes? What kind of church are we going to be? Are we going to be one that labels? Are we going to be one that criticizes, that condemns, that corrects? Are we going to be one that, like Christ, welcomes unrighteous people into the kingdom of God? For that is what we were. But we've been washed and sanctified and justified. So if you are here today and you are straight, hear this. You are free to love gay people. You are free to go love your gay neighbors, your gay friends, your gay colleagues, your gay family members. Go love them. Go love them as Christ loved them. If you're here today, and maybe you are gay, or maybe you have friends who have been hurt by the church who are gay, here's what I would tell you. You're free to love us too. We're imperfect. We don't have it all figured out. The journey with God can be a bit messy. Sometimes from scripture like today, we don't necessarily have answers, but we just kind of just get some questions. 
that's what this looks like. And if you are gay, let me apologize on behalf of the church for the times we have labeled you instead of loving you. For the times we've abandoned grace and just beat you over the head with truth. Please forgive us. Jesus can handle unrighteousness. All of it. Every kind. Yours, mine, and even homosexuality. He can take care of it all. He did it by the blood of his cross. But what we have to do is put our faith in Jesus and receive his righteousness and allow him to cleanse us, not only of our unrighteousness, but we have to let him go to work on our self-righteousness. And I pray that we would be a church, a church that is unafraid of unrighteousness out there, but is intolerant of self-righteousness in here. How we would be people who would go where the religious don't want to go because of unrighteousness. For we know, like Jesus did, it's not unrighteousness that is actually contagious. It's the gospel that's actually contagious. Jesus didn't get defiled by this woman, though that's what their cultural norms told them. No, Jesus' love and grace and truth and forgiveness and kindness rubbed off on this woman and changed her life, which she demonstrated by her gratitude and great love. May we be people like that as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Lord, I pray that in your love, you would open our eyes to see everything you have saved us from. God, remove our spiritual blindness to our own sin, our tendency to overlook what we do wrong and focus on what others are doing wrong. Would you forgive us of that sin as you've forgiven us of all of them? And we don't ask that because we demand it or because we're spoiled children, but God, only because of Christ and what he has done for us, giving us access to you. Thank you that you've put your spirit in us. I know you're working on me. I know you're working on my friends. Keep working on us as a church, Father, that we would be a place where people can experience your great grace as well as your truth, your truth that heals, your truth that saves, your truth that changes lives. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.